Hello, everybody. How are you? We're in the middle of realistic creative effort, creative energy. And we're about to look at the Buddhist view of theater. <laughs> it's so fun. A wonderful story. And, uh, and uh, you know, Buddha was always telling stories and, uh, about former lives and when he was an animal. And, and uh, then the Buddhist tradition spread madly in India through its stories, you know. And one that I particularly love that indicates, and I kind of got to love it especially because, you know, you see, the, so the great sociologist Max Weber had informed the American scholars who looked into Asian religions of, of, from what he knew about Buddhism, which was really only really from Sri Lanka and modern Sri Lanka at that. He didn't really know about Mahayana Buddhism. And so he thought that since Buddhism just wanted you to drop out from society as a monastic, a celibate, a mendicant, a monk or nun, and uh, not have a family, and then since nirvana seemed to be a departure from the world entirely, he decided Buddhism was what he called otherworldly asceticism, meaning a kind of self-restraint and the almost self-annihilation of just leaving the world. And therefore, Buddhism could have no impact on society. Whenever it was somewhere, it was just a, a cult of people leaving, basically, is what he thought. And so Buddhism still has that, that uh, identity, that uh, mistaken identity. And, um, and therefore, they have a very difficult time studying Asian cultures to account for the fact that a great deal of the art of all these different cultures is inspired by Buddha and Buddhism. There's, of course, other art. There are the local deities of the different cultures. And, um, but it, 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 everything is very much pushed by Buddhism, which therefore means it's very much transformative of culture. And once it's transformative of culture, it's transformative of society. And I think that a lot of the early scholars were from Protestant countries where they didn't really have active monasticism. So they assumed that monasticism was sort of a way of having no impact on society. Whereas, in fact, for society to support institutions of pure learning, pure devotion, pure renunciation that were not producing wealth, progeny, soldiers, uh, whatever, you know, uh, wives, you know, mothers, you know, etc. So societies that were not producing would necessarily uh, involve, uh, thank you, involve a, a surplus of those societies and would be an immense expense for those societies. So it would involve a major change in the societies. Like the monastery became in Europe, which was very militarized with warriors, knights going around beating people up, where you could get away from vendettas and things by going to a monastery. And there was like a neutral zone, usually, not always, but usually. So the invention and the intervention in a society, furthermore, in an abusive family tradition where people were traumatized, that a woman who escaped to become a nun or a mendicant in the Indian case was a huge, uh, the only place they could go when they were otherwise stuck. So it was like a family, like a negative family intervention institution, actually. Not always everybody was getting enlightened or fully devoted. They were just escaping there. So the fact that a society would tolerate that means a big change in that society. So anyway, therefore, this, uh, this uh, story very much illustrates this kind of paradox that confused people about the role of Buddhism in the Asian history. So in the Divine Histories, there's a story about the Venerable Upagupta, who was the fourth abbot, you could say, of the mendicant community after Buddha. Actually, the different um, mendicant communities, since basically, in principle, they weren't supposed to have a fixed residence. In other words, mendicants mean they wander around because they beg their food. So they don't have a constant kitchen that can support them, usually, unless some king or super wealthy patron adopts them all the time. Normal households can't afford constant 
extra mouth, you know, to feed. So they move around. So they originally didn't have their own home dwelling, you could say, or home monastery. In fact, the idea of a home monastery was contradictory to the mendicant thing, where you, it, when you became graduated into the mendicant world, you said you left home, that was called, you, uh, you know, Anagarika, the homeless one. Uh, they even modern times they say Anagarika so-and-so, meaning the one without a home. But of course, eventually later, big monasteries were built and people felt that's my home monastery. But originally they were not, you know. So when I say Venerable Pagupta, the fourth leader of the mendicant community after Buddha, it wasn't like, he wasn't like a pope, just like Buddha wasn't, because the different monastic communities that sprang up from the original rainy season shelter that they were allowed to have, the very earliest mendicants. They could stay in one place and sort of near some town or city where people would be able to bring food to them so they wouldn't have to travel and kill insects in mud puddles and things like that. So they were allowed to have that fixed residence just for the monsoon season. And then those became monasteries, you know, over centuries, you know. So when I say fourth leader of the community, he was considered the sort of direct successor of Ananda, Mahakashyapa and Ananda, and then Upagupta, I think he was after Ananda. And um, now Mara, and Mara is uh, Satan, you know, he's the devil. It's the Indian word for Satan. And he's a kind of devil, but he's not like uh, the Western idea of Satan as somebody at the bottom of hell. In the Indian imaginary there, or in the divine world, there's a Yama who is down in the underworld and who judges the dead. And then sometimes some of them, by their own acts, they deserve, uh, they create the, for themselves a hell, but, or other kind of lower life form than human. But, um, but that's not the devil. The devil is more a kind of god in the pleasure realm. I always think of him as a kind of pimp god. And he's particularly like that because he's always trying to lure the monks and nuns back into the household to be back into the worldly life. And he also tries, of course, famously to distract the Buddha on the time eve of his enlightenment. And by first uh, trying to seduce him with his daughters, you know, his ladies, and then second, attacking him with his demons, neither of which work in the case of Buddha. And then they have a dialogue, and just like the Jesus and Satan dialogue in Gethsemane, you know, that, happened, that uh, Jesus does. So Buddha, had, there's the same story originally about Buddha from had some centuries before. So that's Mara. So anyway, Mara, and here I'm writing, an off-scene malevolent force or devil in Buddhist lore, He's red-colored, you know, he's like some pimp in a pink or red Cadillac, you know, running around, basically. Distracts the disciples of Upagupta from attending his teachings by putting on a marvelous theater play nearby. So Mara creates a bunch of his other demons, and then they, since they're shapeshifters, they can make themselves into beautiful actors and actresses and put on a show. And then uh, Upagupta is in Kashmir, I think, in the story, and a big crowd is there and he's teaching them the Dharma, you know, how to be happier and how to restrain yourselves this way and how to be compassionate and kind that way and how to develop your wisdom and so on. Typical Buddhist teaching. But people are leaving the teaching tent <laughs> going to the show that Mara's putting on. So after Upagupta loses many of his Dharma students to the show, he goes to see it for himself. And as the audience is applauding at the end, he then has a wicked intervention where he comes up and offers garlands to Mara and his troupe, you know, like offering flowers to the, uh, to the soprano at the end of the opera, you know, the big bunch of flowers or the ballet, you know, like that kind of tradition. However, in this case, as soon as the garlands are put around the necks of the actors and actresses, they turn magically into the horrific corpses of dead animals and Mara and his troop are unable to flee the magical power of Upagupta, and they are revealed as ugly demons, actually. <laughs> he then makes Mara promise, and then Mara is annoyed because the magical power of Upagupta keeps him in that form. On the stage, they were applauding, and now suddenly people are going, ooh, you know, ooh. And he's upset about that, but he can't move because he puts this sort of hold on him, tractor beam on him, and Mupagupta does, with his supernormal powers. And then he makes Mara promise, okay, I'll let you go 
if you promise never to go and put on a big show like a circus troupe, Barnum and Bailey, whatever it might be, next to a Dharma teaching place to distract the students. Okay, you have to promise that. So then Mara says, okay, 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 I won't disturb you again, you know, that kind of thing. So then Upagupta says, okay, you can go now, except wait. And just before he lets him go, Upagupta gets tempted himself. He says, wait a minute, before you go, please do me a favor. He, he appeals to Mara, the devil. Since you are such a skilled actor and shapeshifter, I want you and your troupe to shapeshift and turn yourselves into actors who portray Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, and his foremost disciples, like Mahakasyapa and others, Ananda, since I never got to meet him a few generations ago, because I was born after he passed away. And I would really love to see what Buddha looked like. And you, I know you're a master shapeshifter, so please put on a Buddha show for me just before you go. Because he has no right to ask him because he's already let him go, but he asked that for that favor. So then Mara says, okay, I can do that with my magical show business powers, he says. But in turn, you have to make a promise to me. When I come on stage appearing as Shakyamuni Buddha, don't get confused and bow to me in a fit of devotion as if I actually am the Buddha, since impersonating the Buddha would be a great sin for me. <laughs> so Upagupta agrees, of course, I would never mistake you, the devil Mara, for Buddha. I know that you're just putting on a show, of course. So then Mara takes off the magical garlands of the dead animal corpses around the necks of the, of the actors, and then Mara and his troop go off stage and they shapeshift into Buddha and his disciples. Then they come out like Buddha going on a prominent head to beg a breakfast brunch from, as he did you know, a century ago, uh, or 60, 70 years before. And then he becomes overwhelmed by a joyful feeling of deep faith, Upagupta does, and he forgets completely that it's the devil, and he bows down weeping with joy for seeing the Buddha. <laughs> Then Mara cuts that short, immediately switches back to his Mara shape at once and reverts to his normal form of a bright red god of lust and says, you know, what I say right here, I call him the divine pimp, and departs saying, all promises are off now since you, the venerable Bhagupta, you broke your promise to me. So now I can go interrupt and, and interfere with your Dharma teaching anytime. <laughs> Now, this illustrates the role of art even for the dualistic Buddhists. Those are the ones who think nirvana is somewhere else, you know, and they're leaving the world, who think they are going to escape the world entirely into another realm and so have no need for art. They don't want to beautify the world, in other words. Of course, sense objects can be avoided as the snares of the devil Mara, yet they also can bring home the presence of Buddha and the Buddhaverse of freedom and beauty and bliss. So therefore, Buddhist art, you know. In the non-dualistic universal vehicle literature, the creative performance art created by Buddha and the Bodhisattvas is much more magnificent, even involving the creation of parallel universes, Buddha lands, or I call them, which I call Buddha verses, you know, pure lands, what, they, what the Buddhists call, magical jewel trees, and so forth. It even involves temporarily transforming people's bodies into other kinds of bodies, to make a male feel himself to be like a female, make a female feel herself to be a male, whatever might help them expand their sense of identification, sort of magically, like the goddess in Vimalakirti, who when Vimalakirti finally, I mean, when, when Shariputra, after dialoguing with her and being instructed and shown for his partiality of thought again and again by her, finally concedes that she's wiser than him, and then says, well, you're so wise, goddess, how come you're still a woman? <laughs> and then she says, what do you mean, what's a, what's a woman? And, uh, and I'm just an illusion, Illus it's illusory, this, these bodies that we have. But didn't Buddha say, ultimately, there's no such thing as gender? And yes, well, he did, but, you know, he said. So then she switches bodies with him, and then he's suddenly in her body, and then she, he's, she's saying to him, Venerable Shariputra, how come you're a woman? And he says, I'm not really a woman, it's just an illusion you did with magic. I'm not really a woman. 
She says, yes, so. All women are not really women. All men are not really men. And it's time you realize that you're, you're over-absolutizing of your sense of identity by thinking that you're really real, like you are, is your ignorance and your error. Oh, okay, okay, he says that. <laughs> he doesn't really get it or still quite. I mean, it's his job not to quite get it because he's, he is articulating what the ordinary mind thinks, you know. Anyway, so transforming people's bodies into other kinds of bodies to make a male feel himself a female or to make a female feel herself to be a male. Very powerful to overcome sexism. Whatever might then expand their sense of identification. And in the esoteric Buddhism of the diamond vehicle of the Tantra, the Vajra vehicle of the Tantras, the imaginative creations of what I call liberative art are even more magnificent, like the great mandala palaces and so forth, and mandala universes. But even in the exoteric, they're very extraordinary. In the Lotus Sutra, for example, the Buddha, when he's about to give the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, which is the 100% positive teaching of Buddha, where he rejects the four, no, the four friendly fun facts or the four noble truths, and he says, everything is bliss already, it always has been, relax, you know, and he says, but you know, whenever I teach the Lotus Sutra and give that super positive teaching, there is a dead Buddha from billions of universes ago called Prabhutaratna, the profusion of jewels Buddha. And he likes to show up in a giant stupa. His mummy comes, you know, his body, his um, sort of embalmed, preserved body comes back. And he likes to be present when, I, when any Buddha in any universe or in any world teaches the Lotus Sutra. It's like a demonstration of the miracle of the Lotus Sutra. So then he says to the audience, you want to see that? So when, I, when I teach, because he has a vow that he will do that whenever I teach this, whenever any Buddha teaches this. And they say, oh yeah, we want to see that. And then a giant stupa comes, this like a hundred, like a mile tall, and they all get levitated into the air. And then the Buddha pulls back a doorway in what's called the harmika, the little niche in the giant stupa, but it's a big one in this because it's a huge stupa. And there's the mummy in there. I call it the Buddhist return of the mummy. And then the mummy says, welcome, Shakyamuni. The mummy talks and says, welcome, Shakyamuni. I, I guess you're going to be teaching the Lotus Sutra. Come and sit down. So then Buddha sits down next to the live Buddha, sits down next to the dead Buddha, who welcomes him by speaking, showing that there's no death, actually, really. And life and death are the same. And then he teaches the Lotus Sutra from that. So they're very, very elaborate and magnificent manifestations, miraculous manifestations of amazing grace in the Mahayana. And that's not even in Tantra. Today, thanks to the technology of video and computers, artists can create the most extraordinary special effects for an audience, almost lifting them out of their seats and immersing them in the other worlds of sci-fi or fantasy films, or recreating dramatic events from history. In the 1990s, in our effort to get Western people to imagine the reality of Tibet and its material culture before it was invaded, the Tibetan temples and monasteries, aristocratic houses, Lama Mandala palaces, square kilometers of wall paintings, tanka icons, sculptures, stupas, carved cliff sites, and so on, all destroyed by the communists. But anyway, our Tibet House US in New York did many exhibitions. 11 in different cities all over the world and different museums and lots of smaller ones in smaller towns. But nothing we did would compare to the effect on millions of people of two Hollywood films, Kundun by Melissa Matheson and Martin Scorsese and Seven Years in Tibet by Jean-Jacques Annaud. The first it depicts the life story of His Holiness the Dalai Lama from birth to his escape to India for the first 24 years of his life. And the second, the recreation of the adventures in Tibet of the Austrian mountain climber Heinrich Harrer, who then spent uh, seven years in Tibet and got to know the young Dalai Lama and sort of tutored him about the West to some extent and himself learned to speak perfect Tibetan, but although he never became any kind of a Buddhist. He remained like a secular mountain climber person. He was not at all, he wasn't really interested in Buddhism, but he was really good a linguist and therefore uh, learned Tibetan really well. I, I knew him later, you know. These films multiplied a million fold the effect of getting Western and free Asian people to fall in love with the beauty of ancient Tibet. Those two films did. And the other film that we're going to make in the future, a 
about life of Buddha and life of Dalai Lama, we're going to make those films. And even maybe life of six Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama who was a layman and had, like, uh, had uh, relationships with, with uh, partners and so forth, and wonderful. And who's beloved by the Tibetans and a great poet, actually, the sixth Dalai Lama. Art, now here there's a heading, Art has all methods of liberating beings from suffering. How does that work? Now, art, in its broadest sense, is the technique and activity and product of doing something skillfully beneficial. The Sanskrit word upaya, which many people translate, unfortunately, as skillful means or method or strategy, and it can be translated even as trick. I translate as art, as in the arts and sciences taught in the university. And because what is included in the arts and sciences? Engineering is an art. Medicine is an art. A debate, legal debate, is an art. So all professional schools, in a way, are teaching arts. You know, the research of a university is learning the sciences, and then people do study science in school. But then how you do things, even the art of writing, literature is art, they are all the arts, you know. So art means doing something um, to, prefer, to change and create reality. And remember, this is in the chapter on creative effort. So it's very much connected to create creativity, the, the art, of, art of liberating beings. You know? And so artistic school, artistic skill, is what Buddha or Bodhisattvas are demonstrating when they produce a special effect give a particular teaching, or make a particular show. They are doing what I call liberative art. And this is why art has always been the central manifestation of Buddhist compassion. The cinematic, for example, in the, transcend, the Ten Transcendent Virtues system, like Prajnaparamita and so on, there's a system of six transcendent virtues, from generosity to wisdom. But there's also a set of ten uh, transcendent virtues from generosity to intuition, sort of a more direct kind of wisdom than the critical, analytical one, but connected to it, of course, which is the tenth one. And then in that, after the critical wisdom of prajna, the sixth transcendence, the seventh transcendent virtue is called upaya, because once you have the wisdom and you've seen the actual reality, yeah, you therefore automatically feel compassion for those who don't. Because when you see reality, when you know reality, like you realize this is all clear light, infinite energy of the life force and bliss. And this, the, the freedom here is bliss. That is the bliss. We're already there. This is nirvana, if we knew that. But when you do get an inkling of it through wisdom, through critical wisdom, the first inkling of it, you immediately see other beings as kind of struggling there and fighting off the rest of the world and feeling all alienated and freaked out. So you totally feel compassion for them in the sense that you see right through them as also made of transparency, and you see that they are actually happy, but then they end up turning that into a struggle and a problem by their misknowing, their misunderstanding of their reality. And so that's what your compassion is, is the wish to relieve them of that. And, uh, and the only way you can do how do you do that then? It becomes the question. How can you relieve them? You can't just sort of blast them with bliss. You sort of can. I mean, that's what they do in rock and roll. But even when they do, they blast. It's just a loud noise unless they put in rhythm and harmony and then get the person to dance and kind of open and loosen up their body and so forth or sing with you, you know, and let's just get them to sort of lift them up out of their normal sense of being like a boundary person worrying about the next person to them, might bump into them or something. So, so you, you become an artist, in other words, you know, and you try to get them to imagine a world that's more fun, more happy than they actually feel, think they feel. And although actually the enlightened artist knows that they all have the capacity of feeling completely blissful just as they are, if they only could switch from misknowing to knowing what they are. That's, that's the sort of job. But art is key to that teaching, it's key. So Buddhist culture and thought, therefore, you know, the, oh yeah, so it's always the central manifestation of Buddhist compassion. The cinematic art of Hollywood at its best is another powerful step in this tradition with a truly global impact. 
Buddhist culture and thought also offer an art critical criterion for what is good art and what is bad art. Bad art is advertising or propaganda, which merely means deceiving people and making them more deluded, putting lipstick on a pig, so to speak, where the samsaric cycle is made to seem glamorous and attractive by being falsified. For example, some films use gratuitous violence to excite or pornographic eroticism to attract, but do not show the true destructiveness of war and violence or the earthy, gentle, and peaceful side of the erotic, which may be ecstatic but is not always glamorous. Good art comes from the heart of the artists, where they are lifted beyond themselves, where they are not seeking, they're not thinking of manipulating somebody by their art, seeking either profit or fame, and have no manipulative agenda. They're just feeling the beauty of whatever it is, the music or the painting or the dance or the whatever, the gesture. They're simply evoking their own vision of something deeper and more beautiful, more funny, more amazing, or more even more horrific in some cases. And this then moves, if, you know, the horror uh, or the tragic and the hor horrific uh, aesthetic tastes, you know. And this then moves the hearts of the audience. So it's like the, the true art only comes when the artist is so flipped out that they forget what they're really doing and they just give themselves to whatever they, is expressing itself through them. And then that helps the other people lift out of their sense of being an audience and is this a good or not good and what am I getting out of this and is it worth it, the ticket and blah, 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 all these kind of, you know, all these concepts that are separating the person from the experience. So the good artist lifts themselves out of that and that automatically lifts the audience out of that. And that, but then they really have artistic success. So they <coughs> simply evoking their own vision of something deeper and more beautiful, more funny, more et cetera, et cetera. It is expressed in Buddha's universal vehicle theory as what is called the artistic emanation body, Shilpa Nirmanakaya, where the artist loses herself or himself in their art, uh, in their act of creation, and is taken up in the emanation body of all Buddhas and becomes a channel for conveying to their audience the possibility of liberation, freedom, and the joy of pure and amazing grace. That's what it is. Solving, okay, so then that now the next heading, solving the planetary crisis with creativity. Creativity is certainly most needed now to meet the challenge of the current world crisis where a culture based on materialism, mindless mechanism of material forces and substances, must adapt to the reality that the seemingly intangible forces of human minds and hearts are so powerful in the forms of greed and hatred that they are disrupting all the mechanisms and material processes of nature. Great scientists and adepts have worked for 1,300 years to build a Tibetan Buddhist culture so powerful that even non-Buddhists take inspiration from it. That's why I take the time to show that upaya, one of the transcendent deeds of the bodhisattvas, transcendent virtues and deeds of the bodhisattvas, like realistic creative effort, samyak vyayama, which is, the, which is the actual category here, our sixth branch of the Eightfold Path, implements the power of compassion through the art of liberating deluded beings. A suffering being first must imagine being happy in order to be motivated to seek happiness. And it is art that lifts the suffering being by providing a sense of relief and then, in, then giving them hope that there could be happiness. So they get some relief and then they imagine happiness beyond what they normally are used to and then they want to seek that because they have imagined it. So they have that hope to get it, you know. As His Holiness said recently in an interview which you can find on YouTube, when he was asked by Piers Morgan, like, Your Holiness, I've always wanted to ask you, what's the meaning of life? And so His Holiness said, well, happiness, he said, joyfulness, he said. And then he looked kind of skeptical, the interviewer, and then His Holiness said, literally, reason, the future is a mystery. Therefore, you have, in the present, 
you automatically are hoping that it will be a little better than the present. And the hope that you then have in the present that it can be better, that becomes your happiness in the present. <laughs> and so therefore, when you, if you lose all hope about the future, then you reach despair and then everything is ruined, he said. So the meaning of life is hope for happiness. It was so brilliant. It was, a, it was kind of what you call in Zen a turning phrase or a turning word, like a great teacher's turning word, where the interviewer, completely nothing to do with Buddhism, you know, you know very worldly, Piers Morgan, British guy. He's like, you know, famous, you know, proud, you know, media guy. And he's asking this. And he was so surprised that, he, that it was happiness. And then he just, those small few words that he said, so you do hope it'll go better in the future, and that is your happiness in the present, he said. That hope. And if you lose that, then it's all over, you know. Uh, really? It's just totally awesome. Uh, it's just, you, you lose your breath when you watch it, when you see it. That kind of thing. The guy did. He was speechless for a moment, you know. So, so okay, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Great scientists and adepts, uh, you built that. You have six branches. Uh, and it is art that lifts the suffering being by providing a sense of relief enabling them to imagine a better future and then giving them hope that there could be happiness for themselves. For example, the Buddhist teacher Dzongkhapa, during a long retreat that led to his full enlightenment in 1398, around two or three years into it, in 1393 or four, he visited a temple nearby his retreat place where there was a famous image of the future Buddha. And he had had a vision during the retreat of the re real life existence of that future Buddha who is in a certain heavenly plane, the Buddhists believe, planning his trip to the world, whatever, many hundreds or thousands of years from now, according to different expectations of different types of Buddhas. And, um, but he's sort of present anyway, in a Buddha way, uh, uh, you know, in a subtle body way anyway. So then they saw this and it very run down the temple that had this famous image of Maitreya where he used to speak, the image used to speak. So they went and refurbished it, okay, and refurbished the temple to the future Buddha Maitreya, the loving Buddha. Later he called a congress to renew the Vinaya discipline rules for the monks, the guiding principles of their culture, also forming a foundational ethical core for lay people. On the 1409 Lunar New Year he founded the great prayer festival for all forms of Buddhism in order to make it culturally mainstream and central in Tibet. To be mainstream, then it has to, the mendicant institution has to undo the military institution because the mendicant thing has to do with, you know, you know rendering non-violent, violent warrior, chauvinist, patriarchal type of people. And uh, finally, he built exquisite 3D gilt bronze mandalas in an especially built esoteric hall in his Gandan Joyful Heaven Monastery to anchor the tantric bliss, freedom, indivisible reality at the heart of Tibetan culture. Since then, the Dalai Lamas have continued this tradition. His Holiness the Great 14th Dalai Lama, in exile and therefore present all over the world, and nowadays, even though he's retired at 90, He's present online or everywhere. I mean, Instagram, <laughs> in between dancing girls and yogis and Taoists doing exercises and what have you, and animals doing funny things. There's the Dalai Lama saying this and that about how, why don't you be more cheered up type of thing. Uh, 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 and monasteries themselves had huge art faculties, and monastic universities did, if you will, which are the Tantra faculties. Tantra actually really is super art, actually. Once during a public conversation on art, between the Dalai Lama at Emory University it was, between the Dalai Lama, Richard Gere, and Alice Walker, you know, two artists, Richard an actor, Alice a writer, I noticed that the Dalai Lama's interpreted, interpreter translated English word art into a Tibetan word meaning only paintings and sculptures, causing His Holiness to say, very humbly and self-abnegatively, uh, ab he knew nothing about art, so they should just talk amongst themselves. You know? <laughs> In other words, he deferred to them all, though everybody wanted to hear as Holiness said. And he didn't talk much, and Richard and Alice did most of the talking. 
And although it's always liked what they said, but you know, he was sort of not really, because it's like, I don't know who put me up here, but I don't know about art. I'm not an artist at all, all of a sudden. So later when I caught up with His Holiness, I had an audience with him about a project we were working on, a little bit later, in a kind of green room. I told him in Tibetan, Your Holiness, please don't say that you don't know what art is. I know you're thinking it refers to some paintings that you hang on a wall, or maybe music, or maybe a theater play. But art really means upaya, which is tap in Tibetan, is the translation for upaya, the seventh transcendent virtue of the bodhisattva, which expresses the compassion released by the sixth, which is wisdom, the sixth transcendent virtue, which is wisdom. So I explained that to him, that really they should have translated art as tap. So art really means the way of creating anything that lessens being suffering. Like me medicine is an art. The, you, the, the doctor of healing is an art. The art of medicine, the art of healing. There's a science behind it, of course. So there's wisdom behind the art. But then the art is how, how do you actually fix this and that symptom? How do you fix this and that cause of this and that disease? So your holiness's whole life, actually, is a total work of art. Please never say again <laughs> that you don't know anything about it, and then you can talk about it. The biography, and he, 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 he liked that, but then his translators subsequently, I'm sure, in other menus, they'll say, oh yeah, art, that's painting. That's, so those are the paintings on the wall, that's art. I'm sure they do. You know, I have no doubt. Because they, no, they don't notice, we don't even notice ourselves. <coughs> like in the university, we have the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And the arts are all of the things that you do to ameliorate the world with whatever knowledge you have gained through the sciences. So it's not just paintings, you know. Okay. So the biography of the Buddha, there are many, there are many biographies of the Buddha, but the sort of autobiography, in Mahayana autobiography of the Buddha, that sutra is called the Lalita Vistara, which actually means the magnificent play. You know, the vast, uh, vistara means like panoramic, vast, you know, play. Lalita is play, playfulness and also play. So the magnificent play, almost like Barnum and Bailey, you know, the greatest show on earth. So please don't say you know nothing about it. Your Holiness, you know everything about art. He was pleased. He said, oh, that's kind of realistic, he said. <laughs> the re in Tibetan. That's real. That's really so. The reason that our lamas were especially focused on art in the sense of upaya. I, of course, I don't mean, by the way, method, means, technique. All of those words are also upaya. You can translate top as all of those words. It's not the wrong, but it's just they're not big enough words. The word art is the biggest word for all of the positive actions that you can do based on wisdom. So, the way of summoning the imagination to inspire people to seek liberation, that's what art is, as upaya, is that Tibet was the first culture that made Buddhism mainstream, no longer mainly countercultural as it has been almost everywhere else. And, and the way you can tell that difference, there's two big institutions in all societies in the last few thousand years that D dominate a lot of the discretionary funding in those societies, you know, the, the allocation of wealth, in other words. And the two of them are a mili the military, the army, you know, the troops, the defense. That's a big one. And then there's the monastic order or the educational system, the, ed the university, which initially was monastic. Uh, you would, that, because it was the monastic one that Buddha invented, actually, in India. It was the beginning of it. It didn't exist in any other culture before that, where people could really drop out of their caste, their apprenticeship in whatever profession they were going to do, whatever their parents did, and even women could drop out of just being child bearers and cooks and slaves in the family, in the patriarchal family, and they could go and just learn and just develop themselves as human beings. And that was not an obvious thing to do in a, any kind of subsistence culture. Everybody had to work and do something. Although there was one job of the shaman in a tribal thing where they had to heal and do, help people cope with death and do sort of magic, you know, the priest, you know, the, the shaman, the priest, you know, witch doctor or whatever you want to call it, healer, you know, all of those, 
all of those professions were combined in one in a small tribal unit, you know. But then they get differentiated in a bigger urbanized one, you know. So, uh, so after you no know, longer like, so countercultural is like Christianity and Buddhism, therefore, cannot themselves really be blamed for the fact that you know, Chris, Christians had crusades where they went and killed people who weren't Christian. The Buddhists had fights amongst themselves of the, who were people who were different kinds of Buddhas. They actually, ne luckily, never did crusades uh, because of the nonviolence aspect in, in the Buddhism. They didn't go and try to convert people by the sword. They didn't think that was good. Based on Ashoka's discovery that you can't really change people's mind by killing them or, or dominating them. They'll just resent you, you know. So, but anyway, so those are the two. And when the military is all assuming and, every, and, the, and the highest value then in a society is how to dominate other people. And then the males who are, are, are usually physically more muscular, stronger, heavier than the females, they can push them around and then they dominate. That's the militarized type of male chauvinist and patriarchal society. And uh, in that, there'll be no room for nonconformism or very little. You, know, you, have, you can have one or two shamans, but if you have a lot of mystics, then they're going to be purged, burned at the stake, kicked out, put to work, sent to the, made to join the army and so on. So as long as that military institution is really powerful, then the, the Enlightenment institution will be way, very weak. But still it will exist, you know. A Christian one is an Enlightenment thing. Be, love your neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. You know, love the, the transcendent, you know, freedom and so forth. And the Buddhist one, and all of them, all the spiritual ones have that in their foundation. They offer a means of freedom to people. And, uh, but they will be weak because the, the, the dominant ethic is the one of domination, conquest, and, and uh, aggrandizement of the ego. And um, so for Buddhism to become mainstream in society, it becomes vulnerable to other societies than which the conquest idea is still too strong. And uh, they, because they, they lose the martial qualities, you know, they, they lose the investment in the military, if you will. And, and, and it's very significant that Buddha, Shakyamuni, in this cycle of history, of the last 5,000 years or so, uh, five or even 10,000, you could say in Eurasia anyway, uh, he was born in the military class. So then he adopted the counter-military institution, which was the, he invented the monastic institution, because he would have been a general. So he was the general on the spiritual side and created the balancing institution. For that balancing institution to become the mainstream institution, it would be like the Pentagon would disappear and its building would be turned over to a Washington, D.C., Harvard for liberal humanities. <laughs> and there might be a little sports, but the sports would be probably yoga and dance and maybe some swimming and running for health, but not those po powerful, violent, you know, military type football, lacrosse, you know, this kind of thing. Not so much those things. Uh, that's what, that, that's how Tibet, you know, it would become mainstream in a place like a, a Pentagon dominated society like America, you know. So, it's so, about, so, so after a thousand years of development from when, they dis when the kings of Tibet discovered Buddhism and realized it would be better to have a country where everybody internalized the ethics, everybody sought the wealth of enlightenment and the joy of living happily and open-mindedly and having a happy society would much better than continuing to gallop down to China or India or Persia or wherever and conquer some people and loot and pillage and take their stuff, you know, back up to the hills with you. It's better to just have fun in the hills, like a yogi <laughs> and yoginis, and be nonviolent and open-hearted people. And so when they started that, it took a thousand years to transform this militarized warrior society of Tibet into, uh, at the time of the great fifth Dalai Lama, is when it actually sort of, you could say, it was solidified at the beginning of modernity. Tibetan modernity was 17th century, same as the Western modernity, but in a way opposite, and um, in some ways. And the fifth Dalai Lama in the six, seven, 1600s. And then as Dzongkhapa showed a few hundred years earlier, art was the key for making Tibet's unique, what I call mass monastic culture, the mainstream. It was a tour de force, setting a clear historical example of the effective art 
of transforming a nation's mainstream culture from imperialistic militarism to monastic transcendentalism. And so that's, uh, that's my um, that's a sociological thing. I never finished my sociology book. I have some essays like that, you know, countering Max Weber. And actually, I should. I should. In my last decades now, if I can keep alive, I will write that one, I think. Creativity as art in the advanced esoteric level. This brings us to the Vajra vehicle, which is the creative, tantric, esoteric aspect of the universal vehicle known as the Mahayana. So Vajrayana is just a subdivision. It's the it's advanced part of the Mahayana. The, they, same, they have the same philosophy, same emphasis on wisdom and compassion, but Vajra vehicle mobilizes the imagination even more immediately and powerfully in transforming the, even the body, you know, as well as the mind. That's the key of what, why it's advanced. The Kala Chakra Time Machine Tantra, what I call Time Machine, Wheel of Time, and wheels can stand just like in America. You say, oh, that's a great, you have great wheels, you say about somebody's car, which means they're a machine, you know. So this is its time machine, Tantra, but it's not like a machine where you fly around in time, but it is where time itself becomes a machine of evolution, controlled by the compassion of all Buddhas, giving beings the possibility to evolve to where they can understand their own natural joy and freedom. So the, the Kala Chakra Time Machine Tantra contains the legend of Shambhala, a hidden land of normal humans near the North Pole, wherein the people have become so transformed and gentle through tantric subconscious self-transformation that it is safe for everyone to be open and vulnerable. In its legend, I came to believe in it in a visceral way personally when I had this weird dream Right. My karma is so bad, I never visited it. I didn't dream. I was in Shambhala. I, I'm, I have still too much bad karma. But I did have this one weird dream where I was somewhere in North Central Asia in the dream, and I was unconscious in the dream, but I was waking from having been knocked unconscious by having fallen from a horse and to, into a ditch and hit my head, I guess, and had a knock, got knocked out. And so I was lying unconscious in the ditch at the beginning of the dream, and the horse was nearby. But there were people up on the road where I had been before I fell off, on, also on horses, I thought. I didn't see them because my eyes were closed. But they were there, and they were talking, and I didn't know whether they were friend or foe. And that was how, where, I, where I became lucid in that dream. And so I was not showing that I was awake to interact with them until I had a sense of what, what they were. Should I, upon wake, should I pretend just to be unconscious? Should I wake and run right away? But, you know, I wanted to know how to, how to handle the situation. So I was therefore very intently listening to what they were saying. <laughs> the weirdest dream. And there was a language like I never heard. It sort of sounded a little maybe like, like Sanskrit, or maybe Tibetan, or maybe Mongolian. I've studied all those languages. Or maybe Russian. I hadn't really studied. I a little know about Russian, but I haven't really studied that. Maybe a Slavic language. I couldn't figure out what it was, but it was really weird. It wasn't like any language I had ever heard. And then I realized, still lying closed and pretending to be unconscious in the dream, <laughs> I realized it was a language spoken by people who had no fear of violent death. That is to say, we have a kind of armoring in our throat chakras. We people who live in militarized societies in these, mo in these modern militaristic cultures. And so, and I know so before that in tribal when we feared like the tiger ripping our throat out, you know, or the wolf, you know or the person cutting our throat, you know. We have like a kind of a congealed fear of assault in the throat area, you know. You talk about cutting your throat, you know. It's like a, in many languages it is. And these people had no such fear, so there was, their language was very mellifluous. The T's and the G's and the, fr you know, the fricatives and the, and the dental consonants were very liquid kind of and gentle. And of course, then the, the M's and N's, you know, the, those kind of uh, 
were very prominent, you know. So it was a flowing kind of language. But I still didn't know what they were saying, but I just realized they had no fear of violent death. They had the different kind of throat chakras. So then I knew they were from Shambhala. They were residents of Shambhala. So then I did wake up and like, hey, you know, like, I mean, it's a dream, but they were out of sight. I could hear horses leaving. And so then, then I woke up. And then I was thinking, sort of still thinking in the dream, though, and I woke up and I was annoyed with myself that I'd missed seeing them and reaching, the, contacting them. Somehow they felt it wasn't time to contact me. And also they realized I would be, they probably empathetically knew I actually was awake and would be all right. There was no blood maybe coming out of my skull. And the horse was nearby, patiently waiting for me to recover. So I'd be fine in whatever it was. So then I knew that there is such a thing as Shambhala. That was my, I know it's very slim evidence. I don't expect to persuade you about it. But that's my one sense of really viscerally feeling they are there. And uh, of course, historically, I feel that intellectually, I feel that I've read the description of the country and blah, 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 and the yoga of the Kalachaka, which is so, so wonderful. And, uh, and, uh, but, and, so, and I happen to love the, 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 that yoga and that tantra very much. And uh, working at it, but a very poor practitioner. So anyway, so, so it's safe to be open and vulnerable. In that legend, it has a series, in its legend, it has a series of 32 kings from the time of the one called Suchandra, who, we, and they have magical knowledge there, the technology like the Atlanteans, or like what we are only just beginning to get to, so they were able to travel by air from the North Pole to South India and receive the Kala Chakra teaching from Shakyamuni Buddha, according to the legend. But anyway, there were 32. The first seven of those 32 were regular kings as they were developing the citizens of their country who knew, who did speak in their own way. So what I was hearing probably was a kind of different kind of Sanskrit that was spoken by people who had a different kind of throats. And they were yogi type of people in a very fluid, mellifluous way, without any art, you know, harsh articulations in it. And, um, but the last 25 of them are called Kalki kings, Kalki, and which I translate as democratic kings. Uh, strangely, I do call it that. I know that's paradoxical, but they're cal democratic kings. The reason being that the sixth king initiated the whole population into the time machine, Kala Chakra Tantra. He then commanded that henceforth they were all diamond yogic individuals, that is to say they were all Vajra brothers and sisters, and that every other citizen was a diamond brother and diamond sister to every other. So there would thenceforth be no more caste hierarchy, but only a single diamond caste. Everybody is of the same Vajra caste. All would be, in principle, equal. So a kind of tantric egalitarianism, so I call that democratic. So they were democratic monarchs. They were magical. The sixth one did that. And then the seventh one, his, who was his son, wrote a fantastic, and he wrote a summary of the vast Kala Chakra Tantra, originally taught by Shakyamuni, a sort of more modest length one, a kind of summary, and then he told his, asked his son to write a commentary on that called the Stainless Light, which I've been working on the translation with various colleagues for years. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful thing. But anyway, and so then from the eighth one to the 32nd one, who is it still in the future, supposedly, um, they call Kalki kings. That is to say, as a king, they're ensuring that no caste hierarchy of the higher ups and the lower downs should be implemented in the society in, as a pr in principle. Obviously, people will attain different things, et cetera, et cetera, in any human society and have different abilities and so on. But they all, in, you know, in principle, equal. All humans are equal. So first time in history written down in the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. The last of the Kalki kings of Shambhala has to deal with an invasion, which he repels. He then proceeds to spread democracy and spiritual freedom all over the entire planet. People who feel insecure in the universe and therefore become addicted to power are afraid and naturally think everything is just there for their own benefit. They fear democracy. Mammals give an altruistic push toward community 
while humans are more vulnerable among species, and for humans, democracy therefore is perfect, with its primary purpose being the education of each person to reach their full altruistic potential in enlightenment. So there I will break in that good, good notice about the existence of Shambhala, that we look forward to a good human future on this planet. We don't look forward to, I mean, we are aware of the danger of, and we should be, of planetary global pollution of the air and the wind, which is now happening, which could make life unlivable for human beings on this planet by overheating everything and destroy, destroying the agriculture and the, and the, uh, the ecology of the system. We're also aware of the danger of thermonuclear all-out war, esca fully escalated all-out war, of destroying it all in a very much quicker by sort of making the whole planet one big giant Hiroshima. We're aware of that, but we don't expect that. We're in fact quite certain that there are angelic forces, there are these more powerful beings. In a way, the Shambhalans are kind of almost like aliens, already here, though, in an invisible country that becomes visible at a certain moment in history. But they're there in an invisible country, and they will see to it that we, we will not drag them down and destroy the whole world along with them, with our greed and our hatred and our confusion. And so the Buddhist tradition is very confident about a positive future, and it will come through democracy, not through tyranny, ever. That is, will always be destructive, as it has been for thousands of years. So it'll be a nonviolent democracies everywhere, and altruism being foremost, and any conflicts and disagreements that will still occur can be verbally negotiated and compromised. And you know, that's the art of politics in a democracy. You have what's called a loyal opposition. You know? it's not, dem democracy is not warfare between op you know, opposing factions. It's a, the art of the possible between them. That's what it is. And that has to be global. That is, which doesn't mean it's American. Look, the Shambhala idea is right there in the Buddhist thing, which was all over Asia. Communism of the Chinese, for example, is not Chinese. It's Marxist. It's a kind of perversion of Karl Marx's brilliant insight, actually, about how economics can be used to enslave people. It's very good. But, of course, the idea of enforced collectivism is terrible and bad. Going along with materialism and non-spirituality is very, very bad, as it's shown itself to be in Russia and China and wherever else it's been implemented. But on the other hand, you can implement through some spirituality, like the Ayatollahs in Iran and other absolute monarchs in other kind of fascistic type of countries, tyrannical countries, you can use religion for that too. So it's not like the, or it, you know, any human absolutism, whether materialist or spiritualist, can be destruct is destructive. And democracy involves people acknowledging freedom and therefore all individuals taking responsibility for each other. And that's what and and becoming altruistic out of joy, out of a surfeit of freedom and joy. That's what they do. So we'll we'll stop there and we'll we'll continue with creative effort. But that's a beautifully creative thing in a social and historical sense. So we we'll dedicate the merit. May we all quickly become Kala Chakra enlightened beings, and, and help other beings become enlightened beings in whatever spiritual tradition they envision it. It doesn't have to be Buddhist or Tantric or Kala Chakra, but we have the power to do it, as they ex explain. We have the ability to do that, and maybe quickly do that to make them just equal to us. And so all the other spiritual traditions become just equal to any other spiritual tradition. And they all enable all their followers to reach the ultimate goal of all their traditions. That's what we ask for. So we dedicate the merit to that. Okay? Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>